All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode. Today we have Stephen McGarvey with us, and he is a number one Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestselling author of Ignite a Shift. And Stephen is also the founder of Solutions in Mind, which is a company specializing in persuasion and influencing with integrity. So welcome to the show, man. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Yeah, I'm pumped to have you on. I think uh, what you specialize in, I think a lot of people are interested in. And it's it's interesting. I, I had a conversation on the podcast a few weeks ago. And what it kind of was about, at least part of it, was this question of like, when I first started out running my business, I read all these sales books, right? And there was something about sales that always felt like a little dirty to me. And I think a lot of people can relate to that because it's like, hey, use this trick, use it. And it's like psychological um, tricks. There was one actually recently that I learned from a YouTube video. I won't mention the name, but it's basically one where like, if you confess to something, if you say a confession statement, and then your second statement, the people will always believe the second things, meaning like, say if you're Burger King, you want to sell more burgers. When somebody comes in, you can be like, hey, look, our fries are not the best, right? There's other places around here that have very good fries. But the thing that's non-negotiable is we have the best burgers. And people will believe the second because the first was like a confession. And you can use that to like sell things and it, you know, so either way it feels, I think what I'm trying to get at here is I think it's hard for people once they learn these tricks is how do you use them with integrity? So I guess overall, tell us a little bit more about that and how you started to even get into this space. So Tyler, I, I feel great too. They told me I was learning disabled, as I mentioned in the book at the beginning in the opening. And th- that's almost like what you're talking about, a confession statement. It's like up front, it, it helps you build that credibility and that integrity with the audience because you're being real, you're being transparent. It's like, I'm not good at this and I am good at this. Or, you know, we we suck at the fries, but we make a mean burger or shake, <laughs> or whatever it is, right? So I I think for me, and and I totally agree with you, I think sales has that kind of like snake oil salesman, used car salesman, you know, sales has that sort of negative persona. And I think the main reason is there are a lot of people that influence and sell without integrity. And I think if we look at the root of selling, it's really serving. It's it's more than, you know, do I have something of value that I can talk you into? It's do you have a need that what I'm offering is actually a good solution? And and if I go about it that way and I want to serve my client base, it's like what you do. You do what you do exceptionally well. And, you know, we got referred to to you and and that's part of the success of the book. I mean, the book's well written, but I wouldn't have had a clue how to put the marketing campaign in place to to do what you helped us do. So I I think I I never felt like you sold us anything. I I felt like you served our need. And I set out with a a vision of, hey, we've come this far. Let's knock this out of the park. Like the the reviews were so good on the book. But we needed to find somebody who, who knew how to service that need, if that makes any sense. And if I, quite honestly, if I had gotten any hint that you were kind of talking us in or trying to sell us something that we didn't need, uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation and I wouldn't have in, in invested in the campaign. So yeah. I think if we, you know, with integrity, that's why I add that in there. If we really seek to understand people's needs, their values, what what's relevant to them and why, and we have something that we can offer like yourself and like us, that that we know is a solution, is, is being able to serve and fulfill that need in the most meaningful way, then I feel really, really good about uh, doing what we do and you can feel great about doing what you do. I think it's the people that are out there selling, for example, I'll just use the cars, although there's a lot of good used car salesmen, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Um, it's you know they know something's wrong with the car they know it's had problems and and they put lipstick on the pig and they try to you know con it off on somebody i think that's where it, sales gets its negative kind of undertone uh, yeah. and it's like everything else in life you know specializing in persuasion influence i always tell people it's like a hammer it's less about the skill set because the skill set is incredibly powerful it's the individual 
who wields the skills. And there are people out there in any field of life between lawyers, accountants, people that do something similar to what you do or what I do, that that don't do it with integrity, that they do it with their own self-interest in mind. And they don't really care about serving the other person's needs. And I think really that's where the disconnect is. Uh, I mean, every con artist on the planet is masterful at the skills that we teach and masterful at building rapport and getting you to trust them. Uh, and then it's just a big con, right? Whereas if they truly use their skills for the greater good of mankind, and I say mankind, I mean people in general, um, I think we'd be better off. No, agreed. And it's interesting is I had a flashback as you were talking to that other conversation. And that is what I actually ended up concluding is literally what you just said is after reading all the sales books that I read and, and I went down like the rabbit hole, man, like, and just uh, psychology books, just everything, you know, YouTube, like probably thousands of videos, just all these tactics, right. It's all. And then I finally came to the conclusion where I was just like, you know what, we have a good product and service. And what I do now, and I think it was probably the same when me and you engaged is I get on the phone and I first always ask like, Hey, tell me more about you and your book. And what are you trying to accomplish? As soon as I hear whatever that is, if we are able to deliver on whatever you're trying to accomplish, then I'm like, okay, cool. Well, based on what you told me, I think that this like offer is a good idea. Yeah. Whereas, and I think probably in our conversation, we went over this when somebody, um, uh, when I get on the phone with somebody and they're like, Hey, like we want to get rich off book royalties. And like, that's, <laughs> I right away, I'm like, look, I, I even say it for like the wall street thing. Like, I'll just be like, look, you're going to pay this much. You're going to make this much back. Makes no sense. Yeah. But if you have a business on the back end, you're going to leverage the accolade and you're going to like really use it, then it makes sense. And we can look at this in an actual ROI type of fashion. Um, so, you know, and, and I just think anybody that would try to sell to someone in that fashion that is just focused on getting rich on book royalties. I mean, it's just so rare. It can happen and I've seen it happen, but it's rare, man. Like I'm just being honest. So either way, I just think like kind of what you concluded to yourself is just like, just fill a need and, but be like real about it. Like really ask, like, who are you? What do you want? And then if you can give them what they want, then sell it to them. If you can't, don't try to sell it. And for me, to your point, Tyler, for me, the book was not about making money. We've run a very successful business for uh, yeah. you know, 20 years. The book was something I never intended to write. Then we wrote it. We were going to self-publish it. Then we got picked up by a publisher. And then I'm like, well, if we've come this far, we might as well knock it out of the park and, and get the you know the number one Wall Street Journal bestseller if possible and, and hopefully hit a couple of lists, which we managed to do. Uh, and yeah. you know, I, I, I owe you a big kudos for that because you you, you you know, told us what you're going to deliver. You delivered on it. You didn't overpromise. I had no expectations because like us, you're expensive. So I didn't look at that <laughs> and not think twice. I, I got yeah. I got to say. So if somebody's just thinking they're going to get rich off the book, forget it. If they've done a business <laughs> and, and, you know, seeing that Wall Street Journal number one bestseller on there and, and USA Today um, is going to mean they, they close another deal worth 100 grand or they get a couple more speaking engagements then for me, it's an old brainer because I think that just lends that credibility. In fact, we just, we've got an e-learning companion guide that goes chapter by chapter with this. That'll be done by the end of the year. We've already sold 150 licensing seats to that, to one of our U.S. clients for next year. So to me, yeah. the bigger picture is that that this puts you on the, it's an expensive calling card, it, an expensive business card. Um, and, and you delivered on everything you said you were going to. No, thank you, man. I, I appreciate that. And that's awesome to hear with the, with the E-class, dude. That is sick. Um, so I wanted to, let's dive a little bit more into the like content and stuff of, of the book. But just before we do that, can you give us a little background like on you um, and I think and your wife, you both are you're in the same practice together, right? Yeah. So Natalie and I are a husband and wife team. Our, our behavioral yeah. styles, if you've ever done DISC or insights or any of those behavioral assessments, we're, we're the opposite. We're like, she manages details and process. I manage a strategy and bigger picture. And together we complement each other and provide even more value to our client base. So we've worked together. Natalie's background is in clinical developmental psychology. Um, she worked for a private practice 
psychologist and, you know, got paid for 40 hours and put in 80 hours. And it used to drive me crazy because I'd say you might as well be flipping burgers at McDonald's uh, for the amount that you're getting paid if you cost average it for the hours you're putting in. So, you know, we, we went through some, some family loss. Natalie's mom passed away. We said, just quit your job. Go spend time with your mom. Uh, you, you'll never get that time back. And then come back and then work with us. And I built the business up uh, enough that it justified having her join me full time. And, uh, and the rest is kind of history. But like I said, I, I felt great, too. They told me I was learning disabled. And I, I still can't spell to save my life. I spell everything phonetically. You can't even spell <laughs> phonetics phonetically. So yeah. I... I <laughs> I always encourage people that, you know, have teenagers or, or young people that are kind of attempting to find their way in life and they're, they're worried sick about them. I would say just support them in doing what they love to do and what they do best and they'll find their way. And uh, and that that kind of led to, you know, the business that we're in is, is a passion of mine. It's I, I love helping people understand how we as human beings filter and process information, how it gets coded in our nervous system, how we run our own mental and physical programs, how, I mean, the, the whole book, the tagline is engaging minds, guiding emotions, driving behavior, how our thinking impacts our emotions, which drives our behavior. And so it really got driven by a passion of mine. And from a kid who hated reading, uh, especially out loud, uh, you can see the library behind me that, that wraps the whole way around this room. It's like my library man cave. And it, it's, it, it's like my sanctuary where I come and, and study. And when, you know, even writing my book, I had like piles this high of books all around me, uh, you know, just pumping stuff into my head to reference and to share stories and to quite frankly, in some ways, um, uh, model the style of book that I really enjoyed that that had not just academic stuff in it but that had stories that brought the, the academia to life and so we've had really good feedback on it yeah I was actually the first thing when we both hopped on the zoom that was the first thing that caught my eye is like your library back there and then it's like all wood like that and even the chair or seat like everything about that room to me just I feel like very productive. Like you get a lot done. I would love to be in that room. <laughs> it's yeah, awesome. Well, you never know. Someday you might uh, might visit Toronto and come for a visit and we'll uh, hang uh, out for a bit. January, we're going to be, uh, we've locked in. So January, we're going to be actually staying at the Four Seasons in, uh, in your area. So if you're in town, we'll definitely have to uh, get together. Oh, yeah. Well, if, yeah, if I'm in town, we'll be very, and I think I will be because I think we were talking about this will be very close to each other. I'll put it that way. For those that don't know, I live near or in the four seasons. <laughs> so <laughs> um, so yeah. that's incredible, man. And that's perfect time of year to come here too, which you probably already know that, but it's uh, like January, February, it's normally like 65, 70 breezy. Yeah. It's just amazing. We're, um, we're just there for a few nights and uh, then we're heading on a, on a cruise around South America for three months. So It'll be uh, a nice way to get away from winter for us and to enjoy some time in a warmer climate. That's amazing. And actually, ju I just don't want to forget because I'm curious about that. If you have info on that cruise, uh, send it to me because like just to hit all these South American spots and what is that kind of what it is like three months? And you yeah, it, at least from Miami goes through the Panama Canal and goes all the way around South America back to Miami again. And we've actually booked a three. I think it's two nights, three day excur excursion to Machu Picchu. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. Dude, that's all right. Yeah, send hey, me. You, you gotta remember it. You're you're early 30s. I'm mid 50s. So you're you're doing exceptionally well for your age. And when you get to be my age, you'll probably be way further ahead than we are. So <laughs> I don't know, but I would go that to, like because I've been wanting to go to South America. So just when you said that to me, I'm just like, oh wow, I can knock out all these spots in one go. Um, yeah. So I don't know. That seems very uh, like a cool gig, just three months straight up every South America spot. Yeah. Um, so, and just last question before we get into the details of the book is what were you like when you were younger? I always like to ask this question because I'm always curious of like what somebody thought they were going to do and be, and then what they actually ended up becoming. So when you were younger, whether it's, you know, kid or even high school, college, like, are you doing anything of what you had thought you were going to do? Not at all. When I was a kid, my grandfather used to take me to a couple of friends of his that had farms and being somebody who was 
you know, born and brought up in the city, getting on a farm and being around animals, I thought I wanted to be a farmer. <laughs> so when I was a kid, I, I kind of had fantasies of being a farmer and working the land and living on a farm. And and uh, I, I just loved animals and, and being in that environment. It was just different. And uh, so, yeah, no, not, nothing at all like that. You know, what's interesting is like sometimes... It, not as much now, but it was more in the beginning of my business when things just, you know, in the beginning of any business, it's not easy, let's say. Like, you know, you have some months that are really good, some months that aren't. But then yeah. I've been running this now, I think it's like 11, 12 years. So it's a little more consistent at this point. Regardless, I still do have fleeting thoughts of like, what about this, like the real simple life? You know, like I have it pretty good, but like, what about the simple, simple life? Yeah. So. I guess we'll never know, but it's- you know, I, I, I think that through when we have our crunch times and we're yeah. flying around like crazy people and, and the pressure's on and, and you're at the front of the room all the time. I, I sometimes Natalie and I say, you know what, we should just scale down, cash out some assets, simplify, buy a, a catamaran and sail the Caribbean. And, and she always says, you get tired of it. And I always say, I just want the opportunity to get tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I think, well, if you want it, I'm sure, you know, you'll, you'll get it. I, I think one thing, Tyler, that, that COVID getting through the last two and a half, three years has taught me. I, I don't, I don't think I'm cut out for retirement as in sitting, doing nothing. I, I, I love what I do too much. And I, I love learning. I love having conversations like successful young people like yourself. And in, in some cases, encouraging them and mentoring them to some extent. And so I, I think I'll keep doing what I do. I may just, as we are doing, carve out more time for travel and, uh, and in, enjoy life as part of the process uh, even more as, as we age and mature. So I think that's, yeah. uh, that's part of that. Kind of like mini retirements. It's, it's like um, yeah. from the four hour work week, that was one of the things from that book that I remember that really stuck with me is because I've always thought, even when I was younger, I was like, so wait, I'm going to do all this work. And then once I'm like 60, 70, 80 or whatever, I'll retire. And then I'm just going to like do nothing or so like, I just, I need something. So I think the mini retirement, like the three, so you go away for three months, maybe you work a little bit while you're on the cruise. I don't know. Maybe you don't, but regardless, it's just three months and then you can come back to your normal. It's not a 100% like we're going on a cruise for the rest of our lives until we're yeah. done. <laughs> well, in fact, Tyler, when we were gone, we were on the 2020 world cruise for five months on Seaborn. And okay. we, we made it around Africa. We did some safaris. And I, I did podcasting as part of that world cruise. So I interviewed some really interesting people on the, the ship. I, I met uh, the royal artist for the, the royal family in, in Britain, um, uh, Mr. Stone, and uh, just fascinating people to just share stories with and 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 hear about their lives and what makes them so interesting so even though we were gone for five months we got kicked off halfway through and the last chapter of the book because my accountant says i don't have time for vacation just research um <laughs> the last chapter of the book is is really summarizing what we learned as we researched beliefs and values around the world it's just a great environment to to be in and to do research for the book as well yeah travel is one of the most i don't even know like I just think back when I did that trip all over Europe and Africa, like that taught me more than I'd be able to describe in words. Absolutely. Especially I remember the Africa part, like just the culture shock of it all. Like we did like Atlas Mountains, Sahara Desert. Um, we stayed in a tent in the Sahara Desert for like three or four nights. Of, it was like a two week whole thing. And uh, dude, I just remember in Marrakesh too, there was like, it was like snakes or like cobras, just like, like, dude, it was nuts. I mean, it was it, from what I'm used to, I should say it was nuts, but like, it really centers you when you actually get out of your hometown and you realize like, whoa, this isn't like Miami's not the only, like every place that you live in has its own sort of bubble. Yeah. So like, if you, if you live in Miami, you never leave Miami. I mean, you have no clue what the world is. I mean, yeah. this is not reality in most places like, or anywhere really. It's just, different 
So, and I, I agree with what you what you said with regards to Africa. It, it was one of the first times in my life we were in Senegal, which is sort of Midwest Africa, and we went on a on a trip today to on a trip that day to see the the fish market, and we had a SWAT escort, which I'm assuming was just a precautionary thing. But you get there, and, and I'm I'm telling you, man, it's the first time in my life I felt like a total minority. Uh, felt yeah. safe enough, or the illusion of safety to some extent, because it was just culture shock, exactly like you said. It yeah. was, like, you know, t- taking me and dropping me someplace so unfamiliar, such different beliefs and values and culture. And, and I think every young person, uh, you know, should have that opportunity or maybe not should have, but would benefit from that opportunity of exploring and seeing the world. Because I, I think kids these days are just spoiled. It's like if they don't have the latest iPhone or or um, uh, whatever the other version of that is, uh, yeah. They're whining and complaining and, and everything's just taken for granted. Whereas I think in these cultures, when you see the thing that struck me, and I don't know about you with Africa, the thing that struck me uh, most rewardingly was the poverty and the happiness in in, in yeah. unison. It was like I'd never seen such poverty. Actually, I, I, I shouldn't say that. I have in places like Cambodia and Vietnam and, and different. But I would group it amongst the, the most poverty that I've seen and amongst the happiest people that I've seen in my life. Yeah, I agree. And that's actually what makes me think of that simple life thing again, because like I remember thinking that, too, when I was there, it was just like you I didn't feel even the people that were like the first thing when we got in the, this guy, and this apparently is a common thing, at least in Marrakesh is they'll like throw, they'll have like a little baby monkey and they'll actually like throw the monkey to you. Right. And your natural reaction is to catch it. So you like catch the monkey and then it goes on your like shoulder and then they take a picture of you with the monkey. And then they're like 50 Durham or like a hundred Durham Durham, I think is what this is like 10 years ago. So I don't remember, but I, even they didn't, I wouldn't say I felt, a depressed feeling. Like I felt like there was a hustle there, Yeah, but it wasn't like, I don't know. It wasn't like the depression that we hear about in the U S or something. Like, I don't know. It, it's interesting. You mentioned, or we were started off talking about that whole selling being serving a need. Um, they've learned <laughs> to survive by essentially manipulating tourism because in, in some cases the throwing the monkey at you puts you in a situation where you've received something that you now feel obligated to give some something back because of it. And they take the picture, right? So it's almost like leveraging the law of reciprocity. You got something of value, you know, because, you know, a, a city folk or, or from Toronto, Canada, Miami, it's not like you've got monkeys at every street corner that you can pick up and hold. So it's <laughs> a unique experience that, that, they, that they basically captivate you with that experience and a picture and then what do you do like you feel obligated to give them something in return and, and they're not shy to ask for it because they've essentially manipulated the dynamic right i yeah, know i'm glad you said that because yeah so i ended up paying them multiple times because they do it i will say this a lot of them did do it though in a kind of scary way like if you kind of feel and i never was like hit or anything so nothing ever happened but they do kind of put you they put you in what you said but then the additional thing is they kind of look at you if you if you say no like oh i didn't even want the picture they'll kind of keep getting closer and closer and like kind of pressuring and then you're kind of like all right here's 50 durham and then literally you walk like 10 blocks another monkey out of <laughs> and then like boom and so but in those situations what are you going to do have a fight with a random person in a country where you can't even speak the same way yeah. Yeah. You just pay. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, and, and I, I have to say, uh, I enjoy to some extent negotiating. And when we go to some of these countries, I'll, I'll negotiate just because some of them are really good at it. So it sharpens my skills more than anything. And yeah. then I always pay them more than they were asking in the first place because they work so hard. And, and what, you know, what, what, what $100 or $10 or whatever the number you pick represents to you or to me, yeah. it, it just has exponential impact in some of these countries. So, or, yeah. or I'll, you know, buy something from one person, give it to somebody else, or like just figure out a way how to leave something there more than just the, the dollars, but leave something that's going to actually benefit them. Yeah, man. And that, I mean, I could talk about those travels because like, oh my God, I remember in the Sahara Desert, like from the views, uh, cause or on the Atlas Mountains, you can just see so much when you're driving up through there. And like we we would go through villages and stuff 
like I just it was like these were like mud some of them were like mud houses and stuff so it's just like like you're saying like even just like 10 US dollars could be like food for like a month for them you know like Uh, just one thing I learned like a lot of the the tour guides don't want you giving them money because then they learn to beg so we've learned like we support for example Cambodia we support an organization called Ratnak International there and so they help prevent child exploitation and trafficking and you know they they teach skills that reintegrate kids into society and and give them skills that they can actually work and 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 learn so we found you know we made them mistake of doing the money in the early days. And then we got educated enough to realize that that's in a lot of cases perpetuating a problem because they look at us and they think that the money is the answer to a lifestyle that it's just very contrasting to to the country they live in. So we found that it's better to use and leverage our resources in a cause that's already there, that's doing something bigger for the culture in a more culturally relevant way than just the money dynamic. I agree. And I do. I remember that now it's, I'm just having so many flashbacks because I remember I had cash and I was handing it out. And then what happens though, is they, they'll start to crowd around. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Then, Gu- you know, Guatemala. It was like, we had them chasing us down. And, and that was in the early days of our travel to countries like that, where you feel so bad. It's like you're, you buy this or you buy that and you feel yeah. like it's a fair exchange. You're, you know, you're getting a nice colorful, uh, whatever poncho or towel or something. But yeah. as soon as you start that, it's, it's like, there's a lineup of people following you no matter where <laughs> going down um so so we did talk about you know the one thing with the monkey but let's talk a little just in the last part of the interview because i think this is something right like i had said i think every anybody in sales or any business owner entrepreneur this like what you wrote about and what you're an expert in is what they would want to know so i mean the topic couldn't be more relevant let's look at like persuasion and influence as a whole and then like dive down in more detail on some of the parts of your book but like if i were to and i know this is a huge question but i'm just curious how you'd answer is like if i were to just straight up be like how do you persuade and influence someone how would you answer that i i would say that the number one thing is you start by establishing a foundation of rapport and whether you're doing it for the person's best interest or whether you're a con man uh, you start with a foundation of rapport (laughs) Uh, and and they, they do. And so I think the number one thing we encourage people to do is understand how to establish rapport and give the other person the experience of being understood, that you're genuinely curious and interested in them and what's relevant and important to them and why it's important to them. And I think if you start off with that as a foundation, you're putting yourself into a good position to find out what their needs are and then serve them more effectively, assuming that what you're offering is something that's going to fulfill their needs. Got it. So start with rapport. And then is there like other, cause I know how big of a question that is. Is there like other, like if there was a next step, obviously there is like, what would be say from like start to finish of, um, and let's assume that, you know, you have good intentions, you have a good product yeah. and service. What would be like, is, do you have like a formula for? Yeah. It, yeah. And so in, in the, in the early chapters of the book, we actually discuss this, whether you're wanting to influence yourself, because I think what people fail to recognize is the same principles of influence when you want to influence someone else, uh, hold true to influencing oneself. So if I'm stuck in a rut or stuck in a pattern, or if I have a limiting belief that's preventing me from, you know, accomplishing a certain, uh, whether it's a, you know, six, seven, eight figure annual income, whatever the number happens to be for me, I remember my one of my first goals was, you know, by 40 to buy my first Mercedes and to buy my first Rolex and to have my mortgage paid off. And so you, you hit those targets. So I think one of the things we, we map out in the book is whether it's something for yourself or influencing someone else, understand how influence occurs. So one of the first things we do in an early chapter is we get people to understand that our thinking influences our emotion, which drives our behavior. And we get them to map this out in what we refer to as current state and desired state. So how am I currently thinking? What are my current beliefs limiting or empowering? What do I currently value and why? What emotions does that trigger? Confidence, uh, worry, fear, anxiety, uh, curiosity. And then what am I doing or not doing? And so we can actually map out a strategy at the beginning of the book. And then each chapter gives the people, the readers, tools that they can go and apply to that strategy to actually accomplish something with each chapter that they read as they move through the book. 
And so then the desire, so I, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, you know, people have gone through almost three years now of ups and downs and anxiety and all kinds of different stuff with this COVID, you know, control, loss of control, all kinds of craziness. And one of the things that we found was uh, I, I did private practice for 20 plus years, coaching people and getting referrals from doctors, psychologists, et cetera. And one of the things that I kept getting referrals for was anxiety. And I thought, what are, what's common with all these people that are coming to me with anxiety? What are they actually doing? How are they thinking? How are they running their brain? So I came up with a definition. It's in the book. I'm going to share it with you. Um, and, and you can test this. Your listeners can actually test this, test it in any area of your life, regardless of your age. Anxiety is an emotion of the future that you can only experience in the now by imagining something that hasn't happened yet turning out in a way that you don't want it to. So people that have anxiety in planes, they imagine turbulence means the plane's going to crash. They imagine, what if I die? And then they feel anxiety. They feel stress. They feel tension. And then they get into a pattern of thinking that way, which then manifests itself and, and creates these neural pathways. So anytime I look at a plane, see a plane, get on a plane, it fires off the mental patterns, which triggers the anxiety. And, and in an extreme case, you can you know end up with a phobia, um, which quite frankly are as easy to install as they are to cure. Um, but in, in general, people imagine imagine things like COVID. What if I can't travel again? What if I get COVID and I end up in the hospital? What if my parents die? What if, what if, what if? And we run our brains and we imagine things that haven't happened turning out in a way that we don't want it to. And then we feel negative emotions in the context of that. And then, and then it prevents us from doing certain behaviors or it keeps us stuck in ruts of certain behaviors. So you, it's like a good exercise. And it's interesting because it's like similar to like a book or like an artist kind of way of thinking is like first thing is like hey let's actually brain dump or mind map uh, either yeah, yeah. one same thing is like what is actually going on up here yeah because most people keep it up here and that's like why writing and stuff is so important like you can't you can't unless you like put it all and it's, it's i tell people that all the time with a book like when you have a book to me the first thing you should do is turn off all technology like lock your door, put a big uh, 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 map or whatever, or a, just piece of paper on the wall, and then just do a thing of like, what are all the chapter or like, what are all the topics that you want to cover? Yeah, be like a hundred topics, right? And they're all in bubbles. And then as you look at it, then you can start to be like, okay, these three topics could all form together under one chapter. Yeah. And, or then you're like, hey, these I don't, this doesn't need to be in the book. And then you end up with like 20 chapters, let's say. Yeah. And the same thing with your thoughts, like what are your limiting beliefs? What what are some things that maybe you're um, overly optimistic about that maybe you should not have anxiety, but more think a little bit more about and like get them all out of your head. What are your beliefs? I don't think most people know what their beliefs are. You know what? They don't. And when I was doing professional coaching, one of the first things I get them to do is, is map out their beliefs, map out what's of relevance to them and why their values start to put. Give me your top 10 values. Most people can't answer that question. You ask your, your audience, what are your top 10 values and why are those things important to you? That That's like a challenge for most people to think that through. Yeah. Because I always say most people don't think about their own thinking. Yeah. Most people don't think about their own thinking. They just kind of, it just runs on autopilot and then they feel emotions and states and they go, they made me nervous. They made me anxious. They upset me. N nobody does any of that stuff to us. We do it to ourselves based on how we process and interpret and, and the meaning we attach to things. And, and so I, I think the, the gift of reading a, a book like this is it's going to improve people's understanding of how their own brain works and how they can get better results in life and how they're preventing themselves from moving forward and shifting some of the things they want to shift. Hence the name of the book, Ignite a Shift, Engaging Minds, Guiding Emotions, Driving Behavior, because we all want to shift something. And, and this just maps out a process by which you can take your time and, and you can apply it uh, yourself, your others, your kids, uh, and, and just set out to, to create that shift on a daily basis and, and that improvement. You mentioned something, mind mapping. I've got probably five books in my library. I could point to the shelf they're on right now on mind mapping. Because I think the more we learn about learning, the more we learn about how our brain organizes information, uh, the more capable we are of recognizing our own barriers and working through them. Yeah, that's so interesting because, yeah, it just reminds me of this one thing that I went through, which 
for some reason, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't fully grasp it, but I do know people that are very good at it. It's called like quantum reading. And it's a, it's a way to like speed read basically. And I took a course on it and I found, I just personally found it to be just confusing, but regardless, I've seen people literally with books that they, they'll literally, they can scan a page in like seconds turn. And they, yeah. they ask, they actually grasp probably like 70% of the book and yeah. they're reading it in like, you know, one, one hundredth of the time it takes a normal person. So it's, it's that idea of like, we're all so caught up in our day to day and like learning where we've never stopped and be like, wait, is there a better way to learn? Yeah. You know, it's funny. You called it quantum, quantum reading. What did you call yeah. it? Yeah. So I, I took a course similar when I was probably five years younger than you are called yeah. photo reading. And it, it taught you to look through the center of the book and look beyond the book so that you were seeing the whole pages as a photograph. And that, that's what's called photo reading. So instead of reading each word, uh, they, they taught you to scan and dip and then photo read. So you captured the information like a photograph in your mind and, and trusted your unconscious mind to process that information. So I, I never really learned to do it all that effectively but it did give me a better understanding of some shortcuts for reading but quite frankly I enjoy reading I enjoy thinking through the information I enjoy making connections and you know thinking about how it applies to different things in different ways so I, I'm I'm more of a slow reader and I like to take the time and absorb it unless I'm just scanning something just for the sake of uh, you know I've got to get briefed on a document or somebody wants me to look at a book and pull through some ideas because they you know rolled it out before bringing us in then I'll I'll scan it and see if, if it's something that interests me but uh yeah, I think it's the same thing because now what you said, that's pretty much what it Did you was. do the finger thing where you go like this with your fingers and you get that little that little hot dog finger in the middle? Yes, we did yeah. that. And and so I think and then also it's um basically the idea too was that you uh, like half of the words or I forget the percentage, but a lot of the words are like the words like the and yeah. it and you don't need to read those actual words to understand what's going yeah. on. So when you take that picture apparently what it's and this is why there's two things one you take the picture and then you know you you can see those bigger words and you can have an idea yeah like i would argue unless you have a legitimate like photographic memory and not just that but like one that you could actually remember like 500 pages you know or whatever it's very rare like that's why i just don't think it fully worked but i do think that yes if you did that like i could probably capture five ten percent of a book doing it that way yeah um, but the, the other thing is, it's probably similar to you, like the books that I'm reading. And I would argue just like, I don't think this method can work with the type of books that we are probably talking about. Meaning like I'm reading like Nietzsche, Carl Jung, like Jordan yeah. Peterson, like, dude, if you're, if you're doing, um, like uh, photo reading or, or quantum reading with Nietzsche, <laughs> <laughs> That ain't gonna work, man. No. I, I, well, I guess, boy, I like to think it through, make the connections. I make notes in the margin. It, it's funny because when I was, you know, a bit younger than you and starting down this road, um, I used to think because they'd written a book means they have all the answers and the book must be right. And the older I got, the more mature I got, the more books I read, as you can see around me, the more I'd make notes because I'd realize that some of these people that write these books are wrong in so many different ways. Like when I gained expertise at what I do and you'd see yeah. like a chapter where somebody dabbles in, you know, whatever, it's something that we do. And you're yeah. like, they've got it so far wrong. But years ago, I thought they were right. Because you just assume they've written a book, they're an authority on it, which is also why I, I think what you do is so cool. Um, yeah. And, and I think your price point weeds out a certain amount of people that are just wanting to get rich off a book. Like you're going to attract a more serious, I wouldn't ma imagine, I don't know your business, but I would imagine like somebody like me, it didn't take me long to make a decision yep. in pulling with you. And and I, I think anybody in, in my situation who's, you know, a, a little bit older, they've been wise with their money, they've got successful businesses. If they want to write a, a, a book and capture their learnings, their life story there and share that with a younger generation... I think going to somebody like you is the best thing that they can do because you can teach them that process. Like you don't know what you don't know. And going to somebody like you who specializes in that process, I, I think one of the best things that, that we've you know, got introduced to was you, quite frankly, because you, you took us through a process that I had no idea about because I always wondered how in the world does a book become a bestseller before it's even in the bookstore? It didn't make sense to me. <laughs> but then when you mapped out your process and, and shared some of your strategy with me, I'm like, oh, that's brilliant. 
Like it's, it, it's, it's so like you, you taken it and you put it into a system and a process that is, is really, you're just really good at what you do. So for somebody like me, I, I think anybody listening, that's a business owner, that's thinking of uh, writing a book, they're crazy to put off calling you any longer and just get on the phone. And if, if they're lucky, they'll get your time and, uh, and they'll get a slot in your schedule because it, it's well worth the time. No, man, I, that means a lot to me and I appreciate it. And I think when you say that's actually, it's funny because when I talk to friends about it, I think you're right on that. It would be the only like variable would be if somebody like won the lottery. And what I'm getting at here is it's like our price, our price point is like at a point where I don't think there's ever been someone that has like given me their last amount of money. Like it's just, it doesn't really make sense. It's not like, I don't know. It's not they got wealthy parents that are funding their book or something along yeah, that line. <laughs> it could be, right? But so, but my theory is it's like if somebody can afford what we do, they've at least made they they have to at least have a six-figure business, at least, right? Yeah. So so then to my mind, I'm like, okay, if they have at least six-figure business, they must be at least pretty good at what they're doing. Like you can't like the whole idea of the con man, I always think to myself. And look, I, I, I guess this statement has been proven wrong in history. There's some con men that have made billions of dollars and they get yeah, caught. Yeah, absolutely. It can happen. But I just, I would argue that probably most con men get caught way before that. So it's yeah. just, it's kind of like, if you're an expert, you can afford what we do, then the content in that book is most likely like pretty, is, is at least pretty good, yeah. right? Yeah, um, yeah. And that makes me feel a little bit more, just comfortable pushing it. Right. Cause that's what I found too, just like yourself is, especially in today's world, even more so than before, you know, it's, it's so much easier now the access to get like to put a book on Amazon, you don't even need a publisher anymore. Like you don't yeah. need a publisher. So it's like, okay, that's good, but it's also bad in the sense that there is literally no filter. So you can't take, and you know, that's why I think it's funny too. You were talking on influence that's what, that's like my life story. When I was 19, I wrote my first book. It became a bestseller. And I'm just like this kid. I felt like a kid and people were only seeing the best-selling author. Yeah. The view was like, yo, this he's 19. Like he's made it like he's, and in reality, dude, like at first, at least I was still scrambling to pay a $400 a month rent. You know what I mean? Like (laughs) I didn't have shit figured out. (laughs) Um, I don't know. So, but the fact that I was a bestseller got me in the door. Right. And like, uh, so I don't know, it just for good, for better or for worse, it, it makes the view of you once you're a bestseller. I just feel like people don't question you anymore. They're just like, it's interesting because so many of our clients that have worked with us for 20 years and we like you, we charge a premium. We're not right for everybody. You know, we, we, you know, do, do a good job, do what we do extremely well. And I say that humbly, just like, yeah. like you do. And we tell clients we're not right for everybody. And you know, the ones that we are right for, we're right for, because we, we teach them a lot. We benefit their brand, their positioning, the way they communicate, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's, uh, it, it's one of those things that I think if you're an avid, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A, uh, an avid, no, that's not the right sure. word. Uh, oh, avid. Avid, that's the word. Sorry. Yeah. If you're an avid reader, there's like dyslexia kicking in. If you're an avid reader, I I think you can absorb information. You can learn. Like there's so many experts out there that you can learn from. And and you mentioned some of them that you're in the middle, in the middle of reading, like read there's, there's, tons of psychology books. There's, uh, you know, there's tons of marketing books. And then you can say, well, how does the psychology connect with the marketing, connect with the branding? And, and then you figure out something that nobody else has put together. And now you're offering something to a client that's of greater value because they'd have to go and read 50 books to figure out what what you've absorbed, assimilated and, and figured out how to connect. So it's like connecting the dots sometimes, right? Yes. And that's the thing, man. It's I, Sometimes I think it's like the more data points you have, the better it is in a sense, meaning like with the, with the, if somebody were to say like, Hey, you've, I've done like 2000 interviews and like, you know, with the authors unite now we've had like 3000 or so clients. Right. So it's like a lot of people that I've at least either talked to personally or of what, or like I'm aware of, right. Like I've been connected with so that many data points. So when somebody asks me, what have you learned from your podcast? It's hard for me to answer. Like there's not just like a thing, yeah. But what it has done 
is like the main thing I think has just made me super resourceful, right? Like for you with uh, the book stuff, right? Like, you know, you could come to me, ask me anything about the book publishing world and I either know it or I could point you to someone who knows yeah. it. Yeah. Like it would be really strange if I didn't at least know someone who knew the answer. And it's because I have so many data points in the publishing industry. Yeah. So I don't, just like you, if you, you can connect these dots, you read, branding, marketing, psychology, and then you end up connecting this thing that nobody else connected. And it ends up become, becoming this whole other thing all in itself. It's, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because we, we have tomorrow, we have a, a meeting with a new PR company and yeah. uh, David, uh, who, who knows you and speaks very highly of you. And yeah. it, it's such a small world. So talk about those data points. Um, you know, you, you didn't push him, but we, you know, he proactively reached out. So I guess he got a hold of bestseller lists or something Yeah, yeah. proactively reached out to us. Yes, and, uh, yes. uh, you know, he was, he was tenacious. I, I appreciated his tenacity and his, his, you know, grit in, in reaching out and, and keeping reaching out until I thought, you know what, this guy, I'm going to give him a, a shot because he, if he does what he's doing to me, if he does that in the context of his PR campaign, he's got to be good at what he does. Right. Yeah. So it, it's kind of like, like you said, connecting those dots. And, and then he wanted to know what I did and, and, you know, congratulations on the bestseller. He goes, how did you hit the list? And, and I said, uh, uh, authors unite Tyler. He goes, Oh yeah, I know Tyler. I've worked with Tyler before. So it's like a small world, right? Like you said, it's like connecting those dots. Yeah, dude, that's so awesome. Yeah, I know exactly. He's amazing. So you'll, you'll be happy with him for sure. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, what I want to do, uh, now I just want to make sure if there's anything we didn't cover, feel free to share it and then let people know, like, where can they get the book, your website, uh, all that stuff, social medias. Yeah, the, the website. So we, we've actually, and it doesn't cost them anything more. It's the same price as getting it anywhere else. But we've actually, through this work with you, and actually you got me thinking about process and systems. Because when you describe what you do, I thought, I haven't leveraged this because I'm not a techie guy. I'm not a... Uh, but I, I thought I, I've heard of these affiliate programs. So basically we've created affiliate links now on our website and we're testing them out. So if somebody orders a book through our website, they pay the same as they would anywhere else. But we now have an affiliate link where um, depending on where they order it, we get a, like a small percentage back, but it all adds up. If a thousand people order the book or whatever, yeah. 5,000 people order the book. So we're testing that. So I would encourage them to go to the website and, uh, and check us out at the website. It's solutionsinmind.com. SOL. I'll fire you off. I think you've got it anyway. Yeah, yeah, I have it. Per solutions in mind. mind.com. And uh yeah, there's there's one in Europe that's a .ca or something, but ours is the dot com. It's the original one that's been around for 20 plus years. And uh on there, just under product or or book, there's Ignite a Shift, and they'll see the logos for the, all the bookstores that it's available in, Barnes and Noble, Chapters, Indigo, um, and they can order on there and, and help us test out this affiliate program that we've put in place. And as I said, it, it costs them exactly the same as if they walked into a bookstore or, or ordered. It online themselves so yeah uh, that, that'd be awesome. and uh, let us know what you think about it because once you get into it uh, we've had really really good feedback you'll see some of that on the website as well and uh our, our goal in really working with you and getting it out there is, is, as much as possible is so people can actually have the tools to understand more about their thinking and how to get better results in life and, and to be able to share that with others and uh so th that's really our goal so it, it's uh uh, pleasure talking to you. I was really looking forward to this. And when you said, oh, we'll just have a conversation about business and life, I thought, hey, you're yeah. easy enough to talk to as long as it's in my wheelhouse of expertise. I'm happy to have the con conversation. No, man, 100%. I was too. And I think uh, I think that there's definitely room for a part two, part three at some point. So yeah, I'm more than happy anytime to uh, carry on the conversation. And I'll tell you what, uh, Tyler, if you think your listeners would be interested, I'm happy to send you a link so that you can offer a free ebook to your uh, to your customer base or to your listeners. Yeah, so sure. I'll I'll fire you off a link to that, and okay. that way, if they just want an ebook, they can get a free ebook. If they want the actual book, which I'm a book guy myself, so uh, even if it's a really good book, I'll have an ebook as well. But I always have a book that I can highlight, and make notes in, and and really absorb that learning. But I'm more than happy to fire you off a link for uh, for a complimentary ebook. Awesome, man. Thank you again for coming on, man. I really enjoyed it. My pleasure. And I look forward to continuing our conversations uh, over time and to hopefully uh, hooking up and meeting in in, uh, in January and we can uh, get a meal together and, and get caught up in person.